I'm going to get up close with everybody. Tell me your feelings. You don't want to know them. <laughs> No, everything's fine. John Mayer, white curtis and fall. John Mayer, white curtis. Good. Four o'clock. It's 
time to quiet down. All right. Hello, everybody. Hello. Thank you. I like interactive. My name is John Mayer, and I'm the executive director of Cali. And you're at the Dancing Faster and Faster, the Future of Cali. So what a strange name. I have to admit, it was, um, it was, a, it was a, a word association game going on in my head about, uh, you know, should, should I, you know, frene uh, Cali continuing our frenetic pace or something like that. And Dancing Faster and Faster came up because I had just recently seen this video that I'm going to show you. Here we are. Apparently there's no sound. Oh, here we are. I had the sound turn on. Oh, Samsung. Here, you have to click a button to make sure you can make it louder. We need some energy, right? Because it's four o'clock and, you know, it's the end of the second day of the conference. <clears throat> so, so I don't know, I saw that video and, and it, this guy just, first of all, I don't know where he gets the money to travel all these places, you know. And, and that's, and, and the, the, as soon as I had that thought, I realized, whoa, my job has taken over my life. Because the first thought of like seeing that video was, what's his sustainability model? <laughs> you know, his job is basically to go around the world and dance and get a video of it and then stick them up on YouTube. And I and I'm like, maybe he makes some money on the ads they sell, but certainly not enough to buy, you know, tickets. You know, to go to Zimbabwe and stuff like that. <clears throat> so I don't know. <clears throat> maybe I'm too ensconced. <clears throat> So uh, the TLDR of this uh, session, I'm going to talk about sustainability lessons and the poll, AJ author, several times, learn a lot at org, Elaine Dell, incubators. All right. So um, the first thing, I'll, I'm going to start with the hard topic, hardest topic always, which is dollars, or as we like to call it, sustainability. Um, <clears throat> that means able to be maintained at a certain rate or level, or able to be upheld or defended. I like that one. You know, basically, you know, Cali gets most, 98, 95% of its money from U.S. law school dues. And all but a very few number of schools, uh, Wisconsin, are uh, members of Cali. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Washington Lee. I think that's it. Um, oh, no, Washburn. Um, but I'm working on them. They're, they're, they're having a hard time. Um, are members of Cali, and here's the amazing thing: we we've we have not lost many members. We've lost one or two in the last five years. And five years ago, I was predicting to the board that we'd be down to like 180 or 170. We would have lost 30 or 40 members because of this crisis in legal education. You know, and it was it was my pessimism that you know, oh, technology, it's not like core, and people just see us as an add-on or something like that. And the feedback uh, that we've gotten over those years, as we have not lost members, is no. Everything's going where you're going. You're, you're, you're the solution, we hope. Dance faster, John. <laughs> you know, their, their schools are seeing technology, I don't, not, not, as, not as like a savior or as, as the ultimate solution to everything, but certainly a tool set or a way or a means to get there. And, and I love that some of our messaging, which is that we're a consortium, so we're on your side. I mean, I even heard it, uh, I don't know how many of you were here for the, um, the, the assessment session this morning, this afternoon. 
uh, first thing. You know, people are saying, you know, well, what if we put our stuff in there and the company goes away or they try to claim it? And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's the right way to think. We gotta be careful and protective of our stuff. And the model, which is that commercial opera entities or vendors will do everything for us as long as we can barely explain to them the complexity of what we do is wrong. We have to do things for ourselves. And the way that individ and when individual organizations express that, it's, it's a small noise. But when a group of organizations express that as a consortia, it's a roar. Hey, that's Callie's new motto. Callie, we'll help you roar, right? <laughs> so we also have membership, though, and growing, growing amongst law schools outside the US. Hey, we should do that in our country. Well, we're too small, you know. Join us. Paralegal programs, uh, huge numbers. There's 300 paralegal programs in the US, and, we, and about 80 of them have joined Cali. Now, uh, I should note, I don't know if you know, US law schools pay $7,500 per year, and that's a blanket license for everything that we do for the law schools, whether you're a big school or a small school. And all these other folks that pay money, they pay $250, right? A tiny little bit of money. And that's after years and years of trying to charge them more than that and, and failing utterly. You know, and, uh, and not feeling good about giving it away for free to them because, hey, you know, we've done a lot of work here and things like that. And so we, we, don't, we don't pay a lot of attention to them because they're not our membership, they're our affiliate membership, like US Law School is our voting membership. But we try to pay attention to them and, and work out how, where their needs overlap with things that we're doing or, or want to do anyhow. And that's working pretty good. So we got like about 80 or 90 um, affiliate members, undergraduate uh, college criminal law, uh, uh, some law firms, some corporate law departments, and, um, and even some sort of government entities sort of pop up and disappear. Um, more and more interest there because of uh, A to J author, which I'll explain in a second. But it, our future is looking brighter because we've, been, we've also been fairly successful over the last seven, eight, nine years in attracting some grants from mostly from Legal Services Corporation to pay for a lot of our work that we've done with uh, A to J Author. And that's had value for law schools because we're using A to J Author in law schools as a teaching tool. But there's a, there's a like, have you noticed how much money is sloshing around in foundations and startups and other things that has a law flavor to it or a law tech to it or is justice related? You know, it may not be justice, big J, it might be uh, justice, you know, immigrants need help, uh, veterans need help with their benefits, um, uh, LBGT, LBG, I'm going to get those wrong, whatever. You know, th things that are specific to, to smaller groups, and people want to solve that problem, but it turns out, you know, and there's a little bit of grant money to do something, and because it's 2016, you know, they want an app, or they want it to be a website or something like that, and we're in that space. And, um, and so I think there's possibilities, much more possibilities than ever. More and more I've seen these uh, RFPs come by for grants and going, you know, we could do that, you know, we could do that. But I don't, wanna, I don't want to dance that much faster yet. <laughs> I'm getting a little exhausted. So, um, so you know, but, but, but uh, there's, some of those things are, are going to happen, I think, for us. So we've always, uh, so, so the world out there is, you know, law practice, tech, legal content, and the access to justice and the civic tech spaces. You know, the question is whether there's also a Venn diagram that says that that project is relevant to legal education and whether we can do something there that benefits, you know, that does good, does education, you know, and, um, and works. You know, and A to J author is something that, that fit that pretty good. I wish I could say that that's exactly how we planned it 10 years ago, you know, when we came up with the idea, but it's sort of morphed uh, well into that. Um, but the really interesting question is, are there other things that are like that? Are there other tools? Because I've seen the commercial uh, space, startup space, get all excited about stuff, you know, and then have difficulty finding a way to get enough customers to pay for it, or they get 100,000 customers, they make $10 million, and that just ain't enough for the venture capitalists, and they go out of business. <laughs> you know, they, they're, they're looking for their, their big exit, their, their $100 million exit, and the software goes away, or the, uh, or, or the intelligence goes away, and I think, hmm, that looks like a consortium project. 
you know, because what they were doing was really valuable to us. I'm scared about SSRN being bought by uh, Elsevier. Aren't you? Are you? Is anybody else worried about that? Yes. Well, yeah. So why? I mean, they promised that they won't uh, hide it again. Is that, is that your fear, that they will eventually start charging for it? Let's turn that into a discussion point. Why, why are you worried about SSRN? Don't worry, I won't use your name. Because we've already gotten a takedown order. What? Yeah. From? SSRN. What did you have to take down? We had to take down one of our submissions to our series of SSRN. Because it was copyrighted? Copyright. By? The, it was yours? Journal, oh, by another, by an Elsevier and journal? That happened a week before the announcement. I, so I, so that's I, why I'm worried. I, I, I didn't expect confirmation of my worst fear <laughs> right away. <laughs> oh, I gotta stop coming to this silly conference. <laughs> all right, that's. I don't think we have to go any further than that. Um, all right. Um, you know, and when SSRN was uh, was rising in popularity, I'm like, yay, people are sharing stuff, and I'm like, that really should be a nonprofit there, or a. Uh, you know, or, or something that's got a little bit more control of the community that's making so much use of it. And, yeah, and remember, law was a tiny sliver of SSRN, right? They really got started in finance and securities, I think, and then started to do more of the humanities, and the law sort of came along and said, oh, this is a nice place. You know, and uh, at the time, or maybe earlier than that, there was a group of techies who were trying to do things like a, a federated uh, journal uh, management system, an open source system, and you know, and we all face palmed. They were like, oh, "Really? I thought you were my friend." You know, um, and uh, you know, uh, the, the history of that is is, is 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 interesting, but but uninteresting because we have to we have to move forward. SSRN had a better, had a simpler model, and they did something that nobody thought would actually be attractive, which is they rated law professors by the download counts. You know, I swear we thought of that idea and said, that's silly. <laughs> but it worked really well, right? 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 So, uh, <clears throat> I can't remember what I was going to talk about here. Oh, yeah, learning outcomes. Um, so we're working on a project right now where we are paying law, some law faculty to add explicit learning outcomes to Cali lessons. It's a, it's a first step sort of thing where you have to add tagging or meta information so that we can extract it and use it as a, mm, a taxonomy maybe to plug into other things that have similar learning outcomes. Um, the way it looks, actually this is not the way it looks, sorry Deb, I forgot to change the slide. Oh good, she's not here. Um, but the way it looks is that there will be, you know, uh, literally a list of uh, learning outcomes written by the, either the author of the lesson, if we can get them, or somebody who's, who knows uh, about Cali lessons. You know, on completion of this lesson, the student will be able to name the elements. But there's, a, there's an art to writing these things. There's, a, there's, a, there's language there that's, that's uh, valuable. For my board members, that's Scott Burnham, by the way, who wrote that. Um, and so hopefully in a couple of years, it'll probably take all the Cali lessons. We'll have a, uh, learning outcomes that can be used by you to decide whether or not to assign them or how they fit into the, the larger ABA uh, thing. Now, what I, what I like about that is when we have a lot of them, that is a, that is a sort of a, of a taxonomy. And if we can use a tech, and it's a different taxonomy than uh, the one that we use for the subject outlines, the teaching things. Um, you know, and if you can apply them to chapters or to pieces or to links into our case books, you know, then it, then it becomes interesting to say, well, I want to make sure a student can have this learning outcome and, you know, out comes a trickle of resources, very small and targeted, that fit those things. So, so the learning outcome taxonomy becomes the authoring tool of the curriculum, perhaps. That's, that's, that's the big idea. I don't know how far we can get into that. Um, I'll, I'll admit to my bias, right? I'm a systems thinker and I'm also a programmer, and so I try to put things in their neat little boxes and there's no overlap. And of course, life and teaching and learning and law doesn't do that. It wants to squish out of the sides. So some of these ideas don't work so perfectly. But um, I'm also a strong believer in the don't let perfect be the enemy of good enough. You know? So we'll, 
So as we try these things, we learn new things and we iterate on the ideas. <clears throat> now, if we can get other people to participate in this and other content, you know, well then maybe we can create an open public legal learning outcomes taxonomy that could be applied to anything. So we can start applying it to case books, even not our own, being, applying it to all the other uh, content and materials, even commercially sold materials out there. Um, why not? That's an interesting idea. There are some problems with that, right? Granularity, right? A learning outcome can be very small and very large. Some people think things are small and big, and some people think they should be chopped up into different colored boxes. There's a lot of subjectivity in this area. Actually, that's a good question. And I'm going to turn that into a question. Um, it seems like it would be common sense that everybody thinks you should teach the same things differently. But I have a feeling that's an unexamined assumption and that if you got all the torts teachers in the US in a room and you made them actually describe what they do, there would be more similarities than differences. That's my hypothesis. Somebody tell me I'm wrong. Somebody tell me I'm right. You're right. Ooh. Marjorie, you look like you want to say something. <laughs> no, I think there is a lot of overlap on the substantive stuff and, frankly, on the skill stuff, on what people agree ought to be covered in a course on that. Mm-hmm. So, so, that's, so, so we have a bit of a dilemma, right? We have the, the automated world wanting to say things are in their neat little boxes. And then we have the interpersonal and the mindful world saying, uh, I've got to do it my own way in my own place. And I own my place, the classroom. And we have to, uh, and, yet, and yet we want the efficiencies of automation and scale, but we also want the personalization that comes with, um, you know, bring your own device. Uh -huh. What should I be teaching? Should a student in evidence or say, how do I teach the hearsay? Ah. Is a much more personal question, uh, at least for me. And I don't think there would be the same level of agreement about that issue. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much what, it's how. That's too simple to say that, maybe. All right, all right. Um, and of course, adoption. It's our, it's our number one universal problem. The number one question I get from faculty when I tell them about things about Cali is, I didn't know you did that. You know, that drives me crazy. Um, hired a marketing guy who's now gonna, uh, who's, who's, we've sent over 100,000 um, emails in the last six months. And, I, and I'm like, and how many people have written the complaint? And the answer is very one, one complaint. Take me off your list. And all you had to do was click the unsubscribe button, you know, because we're using, uh, uh, it, it's not a Salesforce's Pardot, which is a message management system so that if you hit unsubscribe, but we know about it and you'll never get an email from us again, sort of thing. Um, but this is something we've never done before. We've never done so much what, what is it called, a blasting of information. Now, we, we don't just send brochures. We try to make it relevant and timely and uh, you know, related to something. And we explain to everybody, you're a member, so we actually are sort of allowed to email you folks and stuff. Um, and so uh, I, I've got a sense that, that there's more, that, that our awareness will grow as we, get at, as we get smarter at that. All right, Instapol. How many of you don't know what Instapol is? Yes, two. That's good. That's good. Well, I don't expect you to yet. Yeah. So Instapol is a, uh, so, so very quickly, Instapol is just a piece of software where a faculty member can go and create a poll and then the students can go there and vote. And, they, and, and it's entirely software. There's no clickers. There's no devices or things like that. But here's the idea that we're working on. So this is a picture of a, of a screen from a Cali lesson. And in this screen, we would add a button called Instapol up there in the right-hand corner. And so the faculty member would be showing this, the lesson in the classroom like this. They would click the Instapol button, and up would come a little URL, a shortened URL. 
Uh, in this case, it says cca.li slash 1234, or maybe it's a number because we can even shorten it more. And the students would all go to that URL on their phones or their laptops or things like that, and they would get this page, a Cali lesson question, and they would read the question and say, hmm, I think it's B, I think it's A. And the faculty member would, at some point, either reveal or, or, or in real time, you know, this is what's happening. The letters on the Instapol are mapped to the letters there. And this is what the faculty member sees. 44% of the students chose A, some chose B, some chose C. So it's basically, you know, Cali lessons married with Instapol as classroom formative assessment. Why didn't we think of this before? <laughs> As fast as I can, I know. <laughs> I know, wouldn't that be cool? Now it gets better. Now wait, there's more. <laughs> I'm the sham wow guy. Now wait, there's more. Now what, if, now what if it's not just a faculty thing? Heck, let's hand this to the students and say, hey, study group. So students are, some, some of them are at the bar and some of them are at home studying, you know, and they send out a, a text with a, with a URL saying, you know, a uh, Cali tournament or something like that. And, uh, and uh, what happens is the students log in and, uh, you know, some of them, you know, the ones in the group who got the message are show up there and, and haven't picked and the ones that have picked, you know, their little pictures show that. So it goes, you know, like common law, blah, 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 blah. You know, and then the, when, the, when it's done, you know, the real John Mayer has uh, got 70% of the questions and surprise John Mayer's got 72 and Lego John's got 49. You know, leaderboards, gamification of Cali of legal education. I'm like, why didn't we think of this before, right? You know, the question is, what do we call this? Do we call it Cali Tournament, Cali Match, Cali Street Fighter, Cali MMA? I don't know. Street Fighter? That's right. Cali Dome. Cali Dome, there we go. <laughs> oh, we're gonna have fun with this. And that's cool, that's, we should have fun, you know? Um, do you remember the last time you learned something and it was fun, it wasn't work? Dead silence. Give me an example. When was the last time you learned something? Avengers. Sorry? Code Avengers. Ooh, so you're learning, learning to code a little bit and you were having fun doing it? Yeah, that's great. Coding is fun. Anybody else? When was the last time you learned something and you went, wow, this is fun, I want to learn more? I'm thinking it was the last time I played a video game. And it had a puzzle. I like puzzle games with, with some puzzles in it. And, and I was like, and then, oh, I got it. Oh, yeah. And my wife is like, well, that's wrong with you. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know but learning. So, so I, 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 I drank the gamification Kool-Aid, and then I barfed it up because it didn't work. Right? You know, and then I saw so many other people try to make gamification or games and learning work. And the problem is, Games are fun and learning isn't. And I know it's supposed to be you use gaming mechanics to make learning more interesting and, uh, and interactive, but, it's, but, I've, but, but what I've found in, in trying this many times is it's, 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 it's a very subtle thing, you know, and that users like law students are very, or anybody is very skeptical of you trying to slip, you know, you know, sugar, sugar coat the, the, the pill that they don't want to take. And it's like, yeah, yeah, I know you're, I know you're making this fun, but it's not, it's learning. Yeah. So anyhow, so that makes me think of things like Instapol as a service, you know, why not build that into all sorts of things that we can do? It gives us formative assessment. We could do things like student versus student, class versus class, school versus school. Yay, California Western is kicking Yale's ass in this Cali lesson. <laughs> And from that, we'll get a ranking system, and then we'll lose members. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right, A to J author. More, more, more than forms. So we're, 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 we've released very soon, or, or it's actually up and running, but not, not totally working yet. A to J 5. Um, let, me think, let me see if I can explain. For, the, for those of you who don't know what A to J Author is, it's a tool that lets legal aid attorneys automate forms for self-represented litigants, SRLs. All right? It's been used over three million times in the last seven years. Um, we're larger than LegalZoom in that respect. We're LegalAidZoom. It's used in 44 states. 
and we've been and we've been hobbling along on a piece of software written in 2004, written in Flash. And it was great until the iPhone came along and said, "No more Flash." And um, and besides, Flash got a little creaky. But in 2004, it was the browser wars, and to make something look good in every browser was you know a cast iron biatch. So Flash saved our bacon by making it look good no matter what browser we're in. Well, 10 years later, we've rewritten the thing completely in JavaScript. No more Flash there. Uh, we had to add a, well, had to. We wanted to add a mobile uh, a reader or viewer because um, um, the poor, many poor people don't have desktop PCs or laptops, but they do have smartphones. Now, don't get me wrong, they don't all have smartphones either. There's still 20% or 30% that don't have any access to the internet. And that's where hopefully law library, sorry, public libraries or kiosks uh, come in in courts and things like that. Um, uh, not to sound cynical, but that's not my problem, and, or I can't solve that, but I can solve this access to forms problem, right? Um, I, should, I should use this opportunity to, to do this. Here it is, uh, DIY forms, uh, family, New York. Courts. That should get me there. Uh, oh, ooh, one more word. Testimonials. I oh, spelled it poorly. There it is. I'm going to blow that up a little bit. Scroll down. So the, the New York family court system uses this. They, it gets 40 or 50,000 usages a year. And they, uh, um, they, they did a mandatory uh, survey at, uh, for, for like about a year and got 18,000 responses out of it. Now, how happy do you think people are that work in family court with all the people that come in with their terrible problems and fighting with their husband that they want to divorce or custody problems and I mean everything you can imagine and they have to fill out some god-awful complicated form and deal with some god-awful system. The employees are very unhappy. I'll just leave it at that. And they automated. We, had, we worked this wonderful woman, Rochelle Klempner. What a New York name, right? And, and they automated a bunch of forms, uncontested divorce, um, um, uh, custody changes, things like that. And these are the answers that a few of the respondents gave us. This program is outstanding. I posted the website on my Facebook. I did not have the money for a lawyer. Thank you. Helpful during the difficult time emotionally and financially. I was very impressed by the ease of use. So I'm going to scroll down about 30 or 40 and pick another one out. This program saves so much time and is stress-free. The program is well done and user-friendly. Really appreciate the opportunity. Let's scroll down about halfway. The procedure is time-saving and excellent. This program was very helpful because I printed out the papers. This was an easy program. It goes on and on like this. They've got 18,000 responses. They're not all there. And they're 98% positive. The court employees worship me like a god. Actually, if they don't know me. But, but they would because they enjoy, they enjoy their jobs now. People come up to them happily to fill out their court forms after they've been directed to a kiosk. I'm almost in tears thinking that. I'm like, software did that? <laughs> so, you know, we know we're onto something here. All right. I just love telling that story. So, 6 0, we're not, we barely got 5 0 out, and we're already working on 6 0, the, the thing sort of compressed, is basically we want to build, we are building, we have built basic doc, document assembly into A to J. And the reason for that is, a to J4 basically just gathered the information and handed it off to Hotdocs. Hotdocs is a document assembly engine. So you had to write the interview in A to J author, and you had to write the document template in, in Hotdocs. So you had to learn two different things, and they talked to each other. And when we started to use this in law schools, it's kind of hard in one semester to teach students two pieces of software. So. Um, and Hot Docs is a commercial product and it's expensive and there's a lot of other, oh, and it's Windows only, which is becoming a bigger and bigger problem because so many law students are Mac users. So we're building document assembly that is divorced from Word into uh, A to J author so that people can do all that work in there. Now, document assembly is a complicated software development process, but it's Clayton Christensen, right? We'll do something very simple and then we'll sort of slowly iterate our way up the, uh, the food chain. Um, and we can do that because software. 
So this is what the flow chart for uh, Iowa intake looks like and uh, in, in A to J. And you think, wow, that's complicated. Well, it's basically just a flow chart. It's just questions in sequence with branches based on the answers. You know? And if you think of uh, A to J author as just questions to gather data to fill out a form, just, then you don't, you know, you're missing a huge aspect of it. Right? It's also uh, a collection of captured expertise. Right? We're not just filling out a form, we're actually leading people down a path, hopefully in a better way than the form does. You know, we're we're front loading it with questions that make sure that if they don't have the information or they or they misunderstand something or they're not qualified, that we get them out of there fast. We explain things to them. Oh, we're we're capturing the the law in the code. This is this is actual this is Lessig, this is a Lessig machine. You know, the, the code of A to J actually is an instantiation of the, of the law, the, the statutes, the regulations, whatever they are. You know, 125% of poverty or something like that. Hopefully, the software has a thing that tells the author, the students or the legal aid people, what grade level they're writing at. And if it, they're writing at grade level over 8, it turns it yellow. And if it's over 12, it turns it red because it wants to slap them and say, you know, make, make it easier to read because these are not attorneys who are filling out these forms. These are not even college graduates. These are, may not even be high school graduates. So you've got to make this stuff simple. And we built that into the interface. And I don't know how many of you have uh, looked at WordRake? A couple of you? So WordRake has all sorts of grammatic-like things. Uh, um, I'm like, oh man, I so want that type of technology to be built in. Um, um, not that I'm going to steal it from Wordrake, but I'm just admiring what they've got over there. <laughs> yeah. um, the heuristic, policy and heuristics, those are, those are the things that are, that are non-legal, but they're vital to success in a legal process. You know, you, you need to give it to this person, you need to do it on this day. I, I, don't, I almost can't classify those things, but we found lots of questions in guided interviews that, that capture those heuristics. And those are even things that are, that, that are taught in clinics, but certainly not taught in first year, second year of law school, right? Because they're, they're local, they're, they're, but they're yet vital knowledge. Um, uh, an A to J guided interview is, is legal education, right? For a brief moment in time, this piece of software is trying to train you to be a lawyer for yourself, for this process. <laughs> you are gonna be a lawyer. You know, not, a, not an unauthorized practice lawyer because you can be a lawyer. You can represent yourself. So yeah, I, I just had my kidney out and I decided to do it myself. And it turns out it works great. You know, I found a video on YouTube. No, just kidding. So, you know, are there, is, there, is there parallels or is there, in, is there overlap in the way you structure legal education to an SRL in this very limited space and the way we structure legal education to a 1L? or that we do in, in a clinic? I don't know. I think, I think yes and no, but, but, I'm, but I'm fascinated by that. And, and checklists. Um, have, have any of you read Atul Gawande's book, The Checklist Manifesto? It's a great book. So basically, his, in, in 10 seconds, his thing is that checklists are for experts. Experts make them and experts use them, in the, like airline pilots and surgeons. And the reason they do is because they're doing high-risk things, flying planes, giving people heart transplants, and you don't want to miss a step because people die. And I got to believe that things in law are high-risk. You know, you could lose your house or uh, lose your kids or go to jail or something like that. And so, uh, so, so A to J uh, guided interviews are often a checklist to make sure you don't skip anything. You know, and, and that's a, an important skill in this as well. So all of these, I think, are legal, are interesting to legal education somehow, to law school. So my piece of software, which we use, which legal aid attorneys use to automate forms, are interesting to legal education and, and back at you. Maybe uh, legal education can give me some insights into how to make that, or legal education can be used to create a virtuous cycle for the people who, who need more forms automated. And that's, that's, that's where the consortia comes in. I could, because I, because Cali sits at that sort of nexus of legal education and access to justice and technology, we have a unique view of that. 
I don't know that anybody else has that. I mean, others can see. Now, you all can see it because I just told you about it. But you know what I'm saying? We live in that space, and so we're, we're, we're seeing some interesting things from that. One of the interesting things is we've worked with uh, now over a dozen schools where uh, faculty have, have used A to J in a class. So we trained, we helped, they, they taught their students, we taught their students A to J, we hooked them up with either a legal aid organization or a court or somebody who was automating a process or a form, and then their students struggled through that process of learning the software, understanding the law, and coding it with A to J, you know, and, um, and the good news is the students love it, right? It's like, wow, this is cool, and they totally can see that this is where the future of practice is gonna be. You know, why would you do repetitive, boring stuff over and over? Automate the heck out of it, right? Or I just saw The Martian a couple nights ago. I'm gonna science the shit out of this, you know? Doesn't that make sense? Yeah, it does. Now, there's some downsides to this. Um, the student, almost none of the students finish the project. You know, 80%, 90%. And so the partner, the legal aid partners were like, eh, hey, close, you know, but I can't use that. <laughs> and so, you know, we're, we're, we're thinking of ways to make it better so that it, so that people can actually uh, get a quality product, uh, a, a finished product at the end. And we're also thinking of packaging the construction of A to J interviews, uh, in, in have the students do a simulated interview. So a partially completed uncontested divorce handed to the student where, they, where we say, well, narrowly research this part of it and then write that part of the interview so that they don't, so that they get the benefit of learning the software and the systems thinking but they don't have to deliver a product. And then in a second semester, we'll say, use those skills, we'll hook you up with a legal aid organization. So we've got a website where we, that's, that's called our project matching website, and we'll be going out to legal aid organizations and asking them, what do you want automated? We've got free labor for that. That's the thing that blows my mind. Students will be paying tuition to be helping the poor. Whoa, I'm making gold out of nothing now, aren't I? Oh, that's what I was saw. Oh, the other thing we saw was that when you, when you watch, when you, when you automate a court form, like using A to J, you should grab that person and drag them and make them watch somebody use the software, because it's harrowing. They're like, why did he do, that, do it that way? You know, in other words, give them some field work. It's also good to get for people to get out of the office, right? Oh, not right. Project matching. I'm already ahead of myself here. So the other thing is we've got a Swiss cheese opportunity coming up. Um, so right now, about 1,000, maybe 2,000 um, processes, forms have been automated. Um, and so you've got to think of it as a big graph, which is a list of all possible things to be automated, like you know, a criminal, a name change, a criminal expungement, a uncontested divorce, blah, 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 blah. You know, there's hundreds of those. And in every state, there's a top 50 or a top 100. And then you gotta go across for all 50 states, right? Because it's different in every jurisdiction. And nobody's ever created that graph and said, where are the holes in that? Because only, because that, that, that graph is 10,000 possible automations, and we know that there's 3,000 with a lot of duplicates in there, so maybe only uh, 1,500. And so we, we're, we've submitted, and we're pretty sure we're gonna get a grant to make that graph, because we wanna see where the holes in the Swiss cheese are, and we realize that those holes are opportunity for us to put into our project matching thing, where we could either go get grant money, you know, we go to Nebraska and say, look at this, you don't have any of these. We should do that for you, you should pay us. You know, or we could go to the University of Nebraska and say, look at this. These guys haven't done this yet. You should do this. You don't have to pay us. <laughs> we just have to use the software. So, you know, when, when you can't solve the problem, you solve the first step to the problem. And then you stand on that and you say, I'm closer, but I'm not quite there. And that's what we're looking at. So that's what the graph looks like. And the awesome part is how it's going up like crazy. The scary part is, look at that drop off. Boink, boink for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, uh, one, one of them is a good one. We've attracted competitors. <laughs> We've been doing this for over 10 years and now there's companies going to <clears throat> courts and selling the ability to do almost exactly the same thing. You know what? Awesome. That's awesome because 10 years ago, the idea that courts would 
do something about that self-represented problem other than complain was not going to happen. And now there's a commercial industry saying to courts, you got to do something about that self-represented problem and we'll sell you a solution. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing that it's becoming part of that. So that's why we lost, so, so all of Texas went offline last year. Okay, here's the bad part. They took all the A to J forms off and now they're going to spend a year turning them into the, uh, um, the court system. You, you think they might have waited until they had the court system versions ready, you know? Uh, okay, the world's not perfect, right? So the other thing is, um, you know, if you think of A to J sort of in a meta way, it's just the Q&A in a branch. Ask a question, get an answer, decide to go someplace else. It's a very simple model. And we're using it to fill out forms, right? But it's also a way to get legal processes, make decisions. You know, did you commit a crime? Are you eligible for this? Uh, how much taxes do you owe? Which may not result in an actual form, but may result in a decision or information that has legal consequences. Calculators, right? Um, uh, what's the word? Um, um, uh, TANF for um, food stamp calculators are, are quite common. The, the word you're hearing from the ABA and from many others is triage, right? Where do we send all these poor people? We'll send them to this website, we'll ask them a bunch of questions, and then we'll tell them what the most appropriate and affordable service that's available to them on the web, you know, whether it's a free form or a modest means, uh, or, it's a, or it's legal aid, or it's a pro bono attorney, or it's a modest means attorney, or, you know, Kravath. Um, yeah, I don't think too many people are gonna end up going that way. Um, so triage is, is, uh, is being touted as a way to solve this problem, and it's basically just questions, answers, and branching going on. We do that, we can do that. I like, I put what ifs on there because I gotta believe that dealing with a legal problem is not always just going down a path of decisions. It's, uh, well, what happens if I do this? Well, what if I change it to this, right? There's gotta be some, what's the word? Gaming the system or, or at least uh, figuring out what the best path is by, by making assumptions. And that's just questions and branches taken and not taken, right? And then uh, ODR stands for um, online um, or alternate uh, dispute resolution, which is, a, which is a huge area now. How many of you have heard of a company called Madria? Right? So Madria was the spin-off from eBay. eBay has 60 million disputes a year. Somebody sold you a belt buckle and it, it's not really silver, it's pewter or something like that. I want my 40 bucks back, right? And by the way, the guy who sold it to you is in uh, the Philippines and you're in, you know, Atlanta. <laughs> it's a dispute. But there's no way it's worth going to small claims court in Manila <laughs> or something like that or trying to figure that, that stuff out. So they have this dispute resolution system um, and it handles these disputes. Now, they, they, it went so well that they spun it off as its own company called Madria. And they're trying to sell dispute as a service or dispute resolution as a service. It's fascinating, right? Um, there's others who are trying to build similar things because dispute resolution is not a, it's not a, uh, what do you call it? It's not, a, it's not one thing. Every type of dispute has its own feel and, and uh, idiosyncrasies to it. And so there's lots of opportunity for exploring online dispute or automated or uh, alternative dispute resolution. You know, even at a low level like ours. A lot of these, a lot of the vendors, a lot of the startups, they want to build big, take over the world, make a billion dollar systems. And, and I love what we're doing with AJ, which is we're just automating a form, one at a time. And because we don't have to make a lot of money, or make money even, because we're grant supplied, I can, I can creep along and get smarter, and I can be open. Um, and I don't have to worry that if I don't make my 10 million and pay off my uh, taxpayers, uh, sorry, my uh, shareholders, you know, I'll go out of business. And so uh, the bottom up approach to these problems, because law is a very naughty set of problems, I think is a better approach. <clears throat> I'm going to skip over that because I'm running out of time. Uh, yeah. Go to learnthelaw.org and read that. No, oh, there it is. So, no, I can't skip over this, okay. So this was the result of a, um, um, of, of, of a grant that we did with um, the folks at uh, New Haven uh, Legal Aid. And the, and the goal 
the, the thinking here was that filling out a form or watching a video or reading a PDF are only individual single steps in solving a legal problem. And what happens when you want to, what you want to do is gather them all together into a checklist. Like do this first, do this second, do this third. Because they, and, and it may take weeks or months to get all the way through the checklist because of the, of the legal system. And so we wanted a place where we could let people create checklists, but we, but we call them classrooms. It's a little bit confused um, in, its, in its messaging, but, but the, it was based on the Atul Gawande checklist manifesto idea, and the idea that we would want to gather links to existing resources in one place as bundles, and that those checklists represented um, interesting ways to think about a legal problem. All right? There we are. So uh, Elingdell, we're 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 churning along. We're, we've we've published four uh, awesome books in the last few months. Uh, Wetlands, a course source by Steve Johnson. It has tons of links out to videos and um, uh, external resources. Cali lessons. It's one of the first books for us to do that. Um, uh, two new torts books: Torts Cases and Contents from Eric Johnson and Torts Cases and Principles of and Institutions by John Witt, who I can't help but say is a law professor at Yale. Yale, we had a Yale law professor who wrote a book for us. You know, take that, Walter Score. Um, so, you know, we're not just dealing with uh, the, the bottom tier schools here. Sometimes I hear that. Uh, U.S. Federal Income Taxation of Individuals by Debbie Geyer and First Amendment Cases, Controversies, and Contacts. Contacts by Ruth Ann Robson, who's uh, an awesome law professor at CUNY. Um, so the good news is we're finding people to write case books and then paying them and then giving them away. Our problem is adoption. Right? It's, we've got some adoption. We've got a few people who are saying, I'm going to use that book. Um, but it's really hard to pry the, the old casebook model out of an out of a existing law professor's hands. I don't know, any ideas on that? <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. I think we, we actually went over that when we were talking about that in, uh, in an earlier uh, session. Um, Hugh McGuire was our keynoter yesterday. He wrote press books and the, and the press book plugin, and we've implemented that at lawbooks.cali.org. So this is not Elaine Dell. This is not our books. This is where you can go write your own book. But instead of using Word, you use WordPress, where, where every blog post is a chapter, and then you can press a button, and out comes a PDF, an EPUB, and a Mobi. EPUB is what's, what iPads use. And Mobi is what Kindles use for, for ebook readers. It's, it's not easy to do because it's hard to write a book, and there's a lot of details around even, even the formatting that you do in this, right? You know, where's the section breaks? How do I write questions? Things like that. But it's, uh, but it's way easier than it's ever been to do this. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and I, think, I think in a few years, this is going to be one of those things where it's just going to be everywhere, and people are going to think we, we just did this overnight. You know, It's going to take us 10 years to be an overnight sensation. Um, you know, I hope that's not wishful thinking. <laughs> you know? but, 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 but as I look at, as I, look at I, I know they, they, do, they do surveys of students in college now and say, eh, we want the print book. You know, we want the print book. We want the print book. But I look at kids in high school, and I'm like, well, how many print books are you using? And Elmer tells me. Um, no, they're getting their books online, right? They still read comic books. Though. They still read comic books, that's right. Well, so, but I always have to remind people that the, the, the goal behind e Dell is not free books. It's nice that we're saving money, but that's not the goal. The goal is the other use of the word free, which is to say we want to give faculty the freedom and students the freedom to construct the envi and educational environment any way they want. Um, because we think we're in a time of great danger and change, and they need to be able to maneuver in that. Cali's an incubator, all right. So how many of you know about the incubator movement? How many of you don't know about the incubator movement? Only one or two or three, okay. So an incubator is a, usually it's a, a standalone nonprofit 
stood up by a law school or helped to be stood up by a law school that is a collection of students who, who went through an admission process to it. They graduated and they are solo practitioners. It's essentially a law firm that the law school helped start and the law students or the law graduates who get into it can spend a, spend a year or 18 months incubating learning how to find uh, clients, learning how to deal with uh, um, modest means people, learning what a billing system works and things like that. And then it's up and out. Go out and become, you know, hang your shingle in practice. Uh, over 80 law schools are either running incubators or thinking of running them. You know, in Georgia, is it all the law schools? All the law schools combined with the Bar Association to stand up an incubator of which there's probably 10 or 20 students per school. No. No? How many? Well, it's the first year, so they're, oh. taking, they're taking a small number of first. Every school is guaranteed a certain number of slots, um, and it's the first year, so they just hired the executive director. director. Yeah, executive uh -huh. director. Who is a GSU alum? Not that I'm. Cool. So, so, so but, but incubators is a thing. There's going to be a session tomorrow on, uh, on incubators in which I'm going to uh, talk with uh, Fred Rooney. He's the uh, godfather of incubators. He's been going around the country uh, pushing this idea. Wonderful fellow, too. And the cool thing is the incubator folks sit at that sweet spot. Law practice tech, access to justice, civic tech, they're very, the, 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 they're very interested in access to justice, but they also know that you've got to make money because we're not just trying to find, create people who are... Uh, lawyers who, who, who will practice and not make money, they have to live. Um, and, and, they, and this is the weird part, right? Law schools want to help incubators, but they also don't want to be on the hook for unauthorized practice or for uh, malpractice or for problem clients. So they, so they can't own the incubators, but they, can, but they want to contribute or, or assist. Um, uh, lawyers work those issues out, I'm sure. Um, but they're in that sweet spot, and if you remember before, I said, well, so is Cali. And, you know, I started to think that, you know, um, well, maybe there's, a, maybe there's room for a, for a liaison or a, or a, or a collaboration or, um, or, or, dare I say, it, a marriage between the incubators and Cali such that we can both work together on the same problem space. And I got to believe that anything that they want to produce in terms of content, tools, training, materials for their proto-lawyers, their solos, would be extremely relevant to law schools in certain 3L and maybe even 2L classes, right? And so that's one of those, that's one of those uh, dances that I think we're going to be having in the future. So we, this is the ecology that we inhabit. We have a very problematic commercial software development model, right? I love it that there's new startups every day and new stuff coming out, and I hate it that they're gone in a year or two or something like that. You know, I always want to take a picture of the sponsor space at the Cali uh, conference and then say, so who's not coming back next year? Um, and, and that that causes two big problems, right? They're not making money and they got to pivot to do something that makes money and they make decisions that are detrimental to our educational goals sometimes. Um, or worse, you know, Coursera, I think, uh, falls into that category. Maybe SSRN, I don't know. That's, that's up to uh, other people to decide. There's lots of churn, and, uh, otherwise called creative destruction. There's silos everywhere. You put your data in, you can't get it out, or something like that. Reinvention everywhere, but not necessarily a bad thing, because some of these are naughty, hard problems, and it takes multiple tries to get it right. So I'm not necessarily complaining about this. I'm more saying we, we, we live in this, in this dangerous ecology in terms of technology and, and legal education. Um, and of course, lots of not invented here, right? Oh, that was my meme generated. Silos, silos everywhere. Yeah. So, so we, have, uh, we have further problems, right? Lack of metrics. It's hard to measure what, what we mean by good, when we say good, whatever you want to attach it to. Legal education, formative assessment, you know, um, things like that. You know, what do we measure? What, what will give us a measurement that we can trust, you know? And, and what's, the, what's the underlying theory driving all this? What's the big picture, man? I don't know. So these are dangerous times. And if we choose poorly, you know, we, we, we could become part of that creative destruction, right? That's from Indiana Jones, the third one, right? 
referring back to the fact that I was in the Indiana Jones yesterday. Okay, never mind. So, <laughs> so we've got new staff. Here's uh, here's my chance to to have the uh, um, the stick figure um, cartoons of my new staff. And there's Renella right there. Hi, Renella. Welcome to Cali. You know, and that's our mission statement. We advance global legal education through computer technology. We employ research, collaboration, and leadership to assist a diverse audience in the effective use of this technology. And we promote access to justice through the use. That's what we're trying to do. That's why we dance so hard. So that's all I got to say. Any questions? Comments? Let me ask you a question. How are we doing? No, let's, let's do, I should turn that into a yes, no. <laughs> have, you, have you been enjoying the conference? Yes. Uh, good. Enough to eat? Yes. <laughs> Too much? Too much? Sorry, what? Shouldn't these be insta-poll questions? Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess you're not doing that part of the <laughs> 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 No, then you'd have to get out your devices. Oh, oh, wait, this is a no laptop session, by the way. Close your damn phones. And... Oh, wait. That's okay, we turned off the Wi-Fi. <laughs> I have a question. Did anything that John said before he came in going to cause me to ask for a raise? <laughs> I told Elmer, my mouth is going to write checks that he's going to have to cash. <laughs> yeah, I asked him how that's worked for him so <laughs> Pretty good. All right, well, thank you very much. North Carolina, like uh, um, legal aid. I'm, I'm not. I'm not good at which states. I mean,
Because they would like to be perceived as. I will go out. 